Greetings, Wanderer. It is my pleasure to introduce you to a unique tour. One that won't take you to impressive landmarks or famous battle sites, but through a typical Athenian home. For an outgoing people like the Greeks, the house was a refuge of privacy. Inside, they could escape from the constant demands of civic life to enjoy the simple pleasures of family life. Look for me when you are done, and we can discuss the things you've seen. Farewell for now. The house, or oikos, was a residence for Greek families and their slaves. Contrary to modern houses, which look outward, the Greek household was built to look inward on a courtyard. The courtyard was the house's central fixture. It was the building's main source of daylight and also the location of religious altars dedicated to worship. The building itself was made up of familiar accommodations, including bedrooms, storage rooms, a kitchen, and a living room. Women were generally in charge of tending to the home, which in Greece was called oikonomia, a term that inspired the modern word economy. A pasta was a corridor that connected a house's courtyard to its residential section. Archaeological evidence from the city of Olynthos reveals that pastas were added to Greek home design in the 5th century BCE. Greeks had no qualms about combining their work and their private lives, and many of them worked from home. Artisans like blacksmiths, sculptors, and potters often had workshops in their houses. Some even operated small stores to sell their work. Similarly, doctors were known to treat patients in special offices located in their homes. Women also worked in the house and were responsible for making textiles, as well as producing clothes and supervising weaving, which was carried out by slaves. If the household was wealthy enough, they could even produce a surplus of textiles to sell in times of financial difficulty. The inner courtyard was the nexus of the house. Functionally, it allowed air to circulate and also provided access to most of the rooms. It also sometimes housed a well or a cistern that collected rainwater. In the center of the courtyard was an altar to Zeus Herkios, who served as the protector of the household. Women would often use the space to sew and cook, while children used it as a play area. Furthermore, if the family had pets or animals, the courtyard was where they were allowed to run free. The bathroom was located in the back of the house. Much like today, it was used for cleaning and washing, although the Greeks used chamber pots instead of toilets. Most bathrooms had a luterion that could be filled with water for washing. Mirrors, razors, strigils, and sponges could also be found in the bathroom, along with small vases called aribaloi, which were usually filled with perfume or oil. Greek homes had kitchens where the family's meals were prepared. The Greeks did not often eat meat, except during special occasions like banquets or after sacrifices. They had mainly a grain-based diet, eating staples such as bread, porridge, or a barley cake called maza. They also occasionally ate poultry, fish, and other seafood, as well as fruits, vegetables, goat milk and cheese, and olive oil. Food was cooked on a tripod, or sometimes in a klebanos, which was a sort of mobile oven. Other cooking implements included braziers, mortars and pestles, a spit to hold food over a fire, platters, 
and frying pans. The family also used the kitchen to store food in containers called pithoi. Symposia were major social institutions in Greece. They were drinking parties held exclusively for men. The party took place in the men's section of the house, the andron, where residents and guests reclined on special couches called klinai. Food was served on low tables set in front of the couches, while wine was placed in a crater in the center of the room. During a symposium, men drank, sang, had philosophical discussions, and played games like kotobos. Musicians, dancers, and even courtesans were often welcomed to attend as well. However, wives and daughters were always excluded. <laughs> the Pyrgos, or upper stories, was the women's quarter of the house, where they could pursue their activities and observe the city without being seen themselves. The rooftops were also used in a special rite called the Adonia, a private celebration held in honor of Adonis, which was reserved for women. At the beginning of spring, women filled terracotta pots with soil and lettuce seeds, then climbed a ladder to place the pots on the rooftop. These pots served as the women's very own Gardens of Adonis. I hope you now have a better understanding of the routines and home life of the Greek people. What would you like to do next? Farewell, wanderer, and thank you for visiting my city. My friend, how fortuitous to run into you in this most intoxicating place. I'd offer you a drink, but uh, for some reason the workers won't let me borrow any of their wine. Cheapskates. As you can probably tell by all the grapes, this is one of Greece's many vineyards. Wine was an essential part of Greek culture, and this tour will take you through how it was made. In addition to being delicious, not to mention lucrative, wine was an important part of Greek economy. I promise I'll meet you at the end of your visit, my friend. See you soon! Winemaking dates back to the 4th or 3rd millennium BCE. It became widespread in Greece during the Bronze Age, and within centuries the Greeks had refined it further. The first step in the process was always harvesting, where grapes grown on rows of vines were collected by vineyard workers. According to Homer, harvesting was often accompanied by music to give it a more festive atmosphere. Ancient Greek wine mainly came in three different varieties, Osteros, Glucotion, and Autocratos. It could be flavored with spices, herbs, resin, and even perfume. It was also much stronger than modern wine, with an alcohol percentage of approximately 16%. Because of this, the drink was mixed with water to make it more palatable. Grapes were dried to maximize the wine's sweetness and prevent it from turning into vinegar. In most vineyards, the drying process involved laying the grapes out on the ground under the heat of the sun, then covering them at night to protect them from accumulating dew. According to Hesiod's poem, Works and Days, the ideal time to dry grapes was ten days and ten nights. When they were finally completely dried, the grapes were collected in jars, just as they are today. The Greeks had many methods for crushing the harvested grapes. 
The most common technique was to use a lenos, a large treading vat where workers stomped on grapes with their feet. Alternatively, the Greeks sometimes crushed the grapes by hand using a strainer, mashed them with a mortar and pestle, or squeezed them using a tool called a sack press. After the grapes were pressed, the resulting juice was poured into large containers called pithoi, where it fermented. Once fully fermented, the wine was filtered through an ethmos, or sack, which separated it from the residual yeast called lees. The wine was then placed in a special storage room. The room was half buried to keep it dry and maintain a consistent temperature of 15 degrees Celsius. These measures ensured the wine wouldn't lose any of its quality before being shipped to market. When the wine was ready to ship, it was poured into storage containers called amphoras. These were smaller than pithoi, which made them easier to ship and display in crowded marketplaces. However, that doesn't mean transporting wine was always a safe endeavor. Sometimes ships carrying amphoras as cargo would be wrecked before making it to their destination, losing hundreds of bottles of wine to the sea. My friend, are you drunk with knowledge? I hope you enjoyed yourself learning about all the picking, stomping, and bottling that goes into making Greece's favorite beverage. Maybe if my customers understood how hard winemaking was, they'd agree more with my perfectly reasonable prices. But let's talk about something else, yes? What else can I do for you? If you say so, my friend, I hope we see each other again soon. Welcome to Corinth, Wanderer. I have a special visit planned for you today. It's an intimate, informative look into the daily lives of Greek women. Corinth was one of the largest cities in ancient Greece. It had an estimated population of 90,000 in my times, and much of that population was made up of women. This tour will shine a light on those women and look at how they lived on a day-to-day -day basis. Look for me when you're done with your visit, and we can discuss things further. Young girls growing up in ancient Greek cities were usually raised by a nurse. They mostly stayed in the women's quarters of the house, the gunaikon, where they spent their time spinning threads and weaving. While there is not much historical evidence of young girls at play, especially compared to boys, it was still known to happen. For example, an ancient terracotta group depicts two girls playing ephedrismos. This was a competition to see who could strike an upright rock from afar using a pebble or ball. The game's loser had to close their eyes and carry the victor until they managed to touch the same rock with their hands. For a young Greek woman, marriage was the culmination of their induction into society. The average life expectancy for women was about 40 years, so most marriages took place when the bride was 14 or 15 years old. The marriage did not require her consent either. Instead, she was passed on from the protection of her father to that of her husband. Married women were not technically citizens at the time, and lacked the rights that came with official citizenship. However, they did receive a dowry that only they were allowed to spend. But in the event of a failed marriage, the dowry was returned to the bride's father. After the marriage was consummated, the woman's status changed from being a maiden to a bride. She remained a bride until the birth of her first child, wherein she officially became a woman. Oh. 
Women living in ancient Greek cities were essentially forbidden from participating in political life, and most aspects of their lives were controlled by men. Their most important responsibilities were running the household and giving birth to children, preferably boys. Most of the time, women's excursions outside of the house were limited to visiting other female neighbors, as per custom. The few exceptions to this strict rule were weddings, funerals, and religious festivals involving women in prominent public roles. Making textiles was the main occupation of most Greek women. It was a woman's responsibility to manufacture clothing for each of her family members, as well as to weave other household textiles. Women with exceptional weaving skills were believed to make excellent wives, and weaving in general was seen as a very attractive quality. For example, Homer describes Odysseus's devoted wife Penelope as spending most of her days weaving at the loom. Similarly, many Greek vases depicting women weaving were combined with images of a woman holding a veil, which was seen as the symbol of a bride. Ancient Greek women cooked in their house's kitchen area. However, since their cooking equipment was small and portable, they also sometimes prepared meals in the central courtyard. This was also where women performed other domestic activities. These activities were rarely seen by visiting men or passers-by because the architecture of classical Greek houses facilitated the social norm that women should never be seen at work. The historian Strabo relays that the Temple of Aphrodite was one of Corinth's most famous landmarks. This was largely due to the temple's female patrons. These hetairai, as they were called, were donated to the goddess by both men and women. According to Strabo, the Temple of Aphrodite contributed greatly to Corinth's wealth. The hetairai were the temple's main attraction, and many visitors came to Corinth in search of their company for which they spent frequently and frivolously. Ah. Hello again, Wanderer. I hope your visit was an interesting one. Greek women lived very restricted lives compared to men, but throughout it all, they held on to their strength and dignity. Is there anything else you'd like to do? Then farewell, Wanderer. And thank you for visiting this great place. Welcome to Argos, traveler. This is Argos, one of the oldest cities in Greece. The Argives were an ingenious people famous for innovations in areas like military tactics. However, what they were most renowned for was their metallurgic artistry, especially with bronze. I hope you enjoy yourself. Look for me at the end of your visit. The area that would become Argos was inhabited as early as the 3rd millennium BCE, but it was in the 7th century BCE that it officially became a city-state. One of Argos's major pillars was its metallurgical industry. As far back as the 8th century BCE, the city was famed for making products like long dress pins and tripod cauldrons, as well as impeccable body armor. In addition to their technical excellence, the Argives were also creative. 
as seen in their masterful bronze sculpting, which became prominent in the city during the 6th and 5th century BCE. Bronze is an alloy composed of 90% copper and 10% tin. Because of this, copper and tin needed to be smelted and combined to create the material needed for sculpting. After the bronze alloy was formed, it was melted in special furnaces. They required a tremendous amount of fuel and were usually supplied with charcoal made from specific types of wood. It's possible they were also coated with a protective lining of clay which would have been sensible given the melting point of bronze is approximately 950 degrees Celsius. Once the bronze was melted and collected, the furnaces were dismantled and dumped. In the 8th century BCE, most small-scale statues were molded using a complicated and lengthy method called solid lost wax casting. From the 7th century BCE onwards, metal workers adopted... At its core, this process involved using sculpting models from wax, making molds over these models, then filling the molds with bronze to produce the desired shapes. The process was advantageous because it saved on materials, produced lighter statues, and reduced the chance of possible defects. Once all the pieces of the sculpture were molded, they were welded together and subjected to the cold work. This process involved repairing the sculpture's flaws by filling any holes and cracks with specifically measured bronze patches. Afterwards, the sculpture was scraped, chiseled and polished until it was deemed satisfactory. Decorative details like hair, eyebrows and moustaches were added with the use of a sharp tool. Eyes, which could be inset with ivory, glass or silver, were attached to their sockets using a resinous kind of glue. Teeth and fingernails were inlaid with silver and lips and nipples with copper. These small touches added color and contributed to the sculpture's lifelike appearance. Bronze sculptures have a long and varied history in Greece. During the geometric period of 900 to 700 BCE, the sculptures mainly depicted idealized heroes, charioteers, and horses, and most of them were dedicated to sanctuaries. The orientalizing period followed in the 7th century BCE. During this time, Greeks began adopting sculpting techniques from the east, and the depicted statues expanded to include mythological creatures like griffins and sphinxes. The archaic period saw statues that reflected a better understanding of human anatomy, which eventually culminated in the realistic and powerful human sculptures of the Hellenistic period. Argos was the home of Polykleitos, one of the most famous sculptors in ancient Greece. His works, like the Doriphorus and Diadomenos, as well as his treatise on sculpting called the Canon, had a massive impact on the art as a whole, particularly in regards to ideal body proportions. Sadly, the original versions of Polykleitos' sculptures have been lost, along with most bronze statues from antiquity. As time went on, many bronze statues were melted down to be recycled in things like weapons, ammunition, and even church bells. Because of this, marble copies from the Roman period are our best evidence of the masterpieces of Greek sculpture. I see you have completed your tour. 
I trust you have a new appreciation for Greek sculptures, after learning of the heart and soul that was poured into each step of their creation. Now, what else would you like to do? Then, farewell, traveler. May we meet again soon. My friend, I see you followed your nose to this lovely uh, perfumery, perfume yard, perfactory? Yes, let's go with perfactory. This sensuous little island is where perfume was produced. Your nostrils are in for a treat, unless you're allergic, in which case I could sell you a wonderful remedy for a very reasonable price. No? Okay then. I'll check in on you at the end of your visit. See you soon, my friend! Perfume-making techniques were invented and perfected in Mesopotamia and Egypt, beginning in the 4th millennium BCE. By the time of the Mycenaean era, perfume played an important role in the Greek economy. Mostly reserved for kings, priests, and aristocrats in the beginning, it later became more widely available during the classical and Hellenistic periods. Greeks used perfume for more than just personal cosmetics. It also had sacred uses. For example, cults would sometimes anoint their god's statue with perfume, and it was also used during rituals like weddings and funerals. Food and wine could also be scented with perfume to add to a meal's presentation. The art of making perfume was part of medicine and pharmacology, and physicians devoted entire books listing the best perfume recipes. Perfume is made up of two main components, a greasy substance called an excipient, like vegetable oil or animal fat, and an odorous substance such as flowers and plants. For ancient Greeks, the most common excipient was olive oil. According to Theophrastus, however, the most valuable oils were those extracted from nuts in the Syrian and Egyptian deserts. The odorous ingredient could be taken from a variety of sources. These include flowers like roses or lilies, herbs like oregano, spices like saffron, resins like amber, and leaves from plants. Some fragrances were also imported from outside of Greece, like Indian cinnamon and Syrian frankincense. These exotic scents were considered exceptionally precious. <laughs> Mixing scent into the fatty excipient was called enfleurage, of which there were two methods. If the flower being used for the scent was fragile, the preferred method of extraction was cold enfleurage, which required an oil-soaked cloth. First, the cloth was rubbed against the flower's petals, saturating the oil with the scent. Then, the cloth was pressed to wring out the scented oil. Hot enfleurage involved heating the excipient before mixing in the scented substance. The hot enfleurage process consisted of heating and distillation. After the scented ingredients were dipped into heated oil, the mixture was then filtered before being pressed and decanted. Once the mixture was complete, spices, coloring agents and fixatives were added, along with preservatives to prevent the perfume from spoiling. Finally, the liquid was hermetically sealed in bottles, ready to be shipped to market. Perfume was usually bottled in ceramic or glass flasks, but more luxurious fragrances were contained in ornamented and painted flasks. Lekethoi and alabastra were elegant bottles designed for women, while arabaloi were used by athletes. 
It was common for the bottle's craftsmen to brand them to prevent frauds and knockoffs. Perfume shops were usually located in city centers, befitting of their importance. In addition to selling perfume, they were also sometimes used as meeting places. For example, the perfume shops near Athens' Agora were frequented every morning by the city's youth. The main purpose of perfume was to attract members of both the opposite and the same sex. We can trace this practice back to a scene in the Iliad, where Hera used perfume to seduce Zeus. Similarly, hymns about goddesses like Demeter and Aphrodite always mentioned their pleasant smell, further solidifying the belief that scent and seduction went hand in hand. However, perfume was also a mark of social status. Athletes covered themselves in perfumed oils during their training and at symposia, and citizens were judged based on how anointed, shiny, and perfumed their bodies were. Hello again, my friend! I hope you see now how important perfume was, not only for aesthetic purposes, but for Greek social hierarchy. I wouldn't charge so much for my own bottles if I didn't know the value of what I was selling. What else can Marcos do for you? If you say so, but I have a feeling we'll run into each other again soon. Farewell! Welcome to the silver mines of Lavrion. The Lavrion silver mines were discovered between Thorikos and Cape Sunion, near Athens. They were rich in the mineral Galena and provided Athens with much of the silver necessary to mint its currency. Because of this, the mines were invaluable to the city, and the resources they provided helped turn Athens into one of the most powerful states in Greece. We will meet again after you've seen what the mines have to offer. Farewell for now, Wanderer. Silver mines were extremely rare in ancient Greece, which only increased their importance. Athens started exploiting the Lavrian silver mines at the end of the 6th century BCE, and used its metal to produce its currency. Production at the mines exploded around 485 BCE when an especially rich vein was discovered. The mine's abundant silver made Athens one of the wealthiest cities in Greece. They also provided the resources necessary to build a fleet large enough to defeat the Persians at the Battle of Salamis. In short, the Lavrian mines played an integral part in the emergence of Athens as a Greek superpower. <laughs> Exploiting the mines' resources required a lot of labor. To meet this requirement and save on cost, Athens leased out mining concessions to its citizens, who had their slaves to do most of the work, alongside poor day laborers. In the 5th century BCE alone, there were anywhere from 10,000 to 30,000 people toiling in the mines of Lavrion. Together, the workers managed to produce an estimated 20 tons of silver per year. Mining in Lavrion was a two-step process. First, the ore was extracted, and then it was refined. It took about 16 kilograms of raw ore to produce a single pure silver drachma of about four grams. Recovered artifacts from the mines provide some insight into the specifics of the mining process. 
galleries were dug to follow the veins of ore. They were small and did not offer much space for the workers. They were also hand cut, and it's believed that it took whole days to dig only a few centimeters. Once the galleries finally reached the veins, the ore was extracted and then crushed on mortar stone to prepare it for washing. Mine workers used washeries to help clean rock from the ore. The washing process required a large supply of water, but Lavrion was an infamously dry region. To compensate, cisterns were built in the mining area to collect and conserve seasonal rainwater. Once enough water had accumulated, workers poured it into wooden troughs containing rock and ore. The water's flow separated the lighter grains of rock from the heavier ore which was caught in depressions at the bottom of the trough. The newly cleaned ore was collected for refinement, and the water was redirected back into a tank to be reused later. Once the ore was clean and dry, it was ready for smelting. Its purpose was to isolate the silver in the ore. To do this, the ore was placed in a conical furnace filled with combustible charcoal. Bellows pumped air into the furnace to control the temperature. Inside, the ore burned, emitting a toxic smoke that was evacuated through a chimney. Eventually, the silver alloy was separated from the slag and collected for the last step in the refinement process, cupellation. Cupellation removed any leftover lead from the silver. The smelted alloy was placed in a cupel, an absorbent bowl made of bone ashes. It was then put in a furnace, where it absorbed the lead and left only silver behind. While the mines of Lavrion belonged to Athens, the city frequently leased them to private citizens who exploited the site for anywhere from three to ten years. These citizens enlisted slaves and poor day laborers to carry out most of the work. The workers had a very low life expectancy, about three to five years, due to the hazardous working conditions. The dangers they faced included toxic lead vapor in the air and lung-choking dust in the galleries. However, they were fed well enough to keep up their work, and their combined labor managed to produce an estimated 20 tons of silver a year. I hope you enjoyed your trip through the mines. We talk so much of Athens's glory, but we often forget the city's power was due to tremendous amounts of work. Work that often had a great human cost. What else would you like to do? Farewell, wanderer. Best of luck on your journeys. my friend. Welcome to Arcadia, home of shepherds, sheep, and she... Uh, manure. Arcadia was well known for its sublime natural vistas. Farmers and shepherds were seduced by its beauty, and it's easy to see why. I have to leave for now, but I'll meet you again when you finish your visit. Until then, my friend! Grain was a staple of the Greek diet.
to the point where Homer referred to his compatriots as mortal eaters of bread. Grain farming was a meticulous process. Due to dry summers, artificial irrigation was impossible, so farmers had to rely on rainfall to water their crops. This gave them very narrow windows for sowing and harvesting. On a farm of this size, only half of the field would be planted every year, while the other half would lie fallow to avoid exhausting the soil. According to the poet Hesiod, the best time to sow grain was in autumn, and the best time to harvest it was in May. Fortunately, if farmers missed their opportunity, they also had a chance to plant millet in the spring. Before planting in a field, the land needed to be plowed a total of three times. Once in the spring to remove weeds, again in the summer to aerate the soil, and a final time in the winter to plant the seeds in the moist earth. The plow was pulled by two oxen, while the sowing of seeds was done by hand. After the seeds were planted, a boy turned the soil with a hoe to protect them from hungry birds. Once the sowing was finished, the farmers waited for winter rains to irrigate the field. They also prayed to the goddess of agriculture, Demeter, and her daughter, Persephone, in the hopes of being favored with a bountiful harvest come springtime. Grain was harvested in the spring using a curved knife called a sickle. With their backs to the wind, the reapers cut the plant stalks and left the sheaves behind before moving through the rest of the crop. Once the harvest was mowed, the sheaves were brought to the threshing floor. Animal husbandry was an important part of Greek agriculture. Farmers usually kept cattle, donkeys, sheep, goats, pigs, dogs, geese, and chickens. The animals mostly fed in pastures, but could also eat some of the farm's harvested grain, as well as damaged fruit and residue from olive oil and wine production. Livestock had several purposes. Their manure was used to fertilize the fields, and their grazing helped remove weeds. Arcadia was a mountainous region believed to be the home of the god Pan, so farmers were more likely to keep sheep and goats than cattle. Most farming tools were simple, handmade implements made of wood and occasionally tipped with iron. The most complicated tool was the plow, which was made up of several parts, including a beam, a drawbar, and a yoke. A two-pronged hoe, meanwhile, was used for tilling soil, and farmers also had tools for digging and weeding. After the sheaves were harvested, workers brought them to the threshing floor to extract the grain. Oxen or donkeys were hitched to a post in the center of the floor. The animals stomping forced the grain kernels out of their casings. Afterwards, the kernels were collected for the winnowing process. Winnowing helped separate the heavier grain seeds from the chaff. It began with using a wooden shovel to toss the grain. While in the air, the wind blew away the lighter chaff, leaving only the heavier grain. To remove the remaining chaff, the grain was tossed in a wooden basket called a lignon, which filtered the grain until only clean kernels remained. Barley, which was used to make flour, was different from other types of grain. Threshing was not enough to separate the barley from its husk, so instead, it was roasted in a specialized tool called a frigatron. After the barley was roasted, it was pounded with a mortar and pestle. The pounded grain was then ground into a meal using either a hand mill or a hopper mill. Grinding was boring work, so workers often lightened the mood with a mill song. Once the barley was completely ground, it was sieved using a wicker basket called a koskinon, making it ready for use.
Grain storage areas needed to be dark, dry, cool, contained, and well ventilated to prevent the grain from spoiling. According to Hesiod, the preferred method of storing grain was in a pithos, the same container as Pandora's mythological box. Archaeological evidence suggests that Greeks may have also stored grain in small walled structures woven from branches. Farms generally needed to store enough grain to sustain themselves for the year and seed corn for the next. Any surplus was either stored for a lean year or sold to markets for profit. My friend, good to see you again. You must feel hungry. I know I would, spending all that time watching farmers working themselves to the bone. Now, what else can I do for you? Safe travels, my friend. We'd better be seeing each other again soon. Hello, Wanderer. May I introduce you to the Keramikos, the kiln that warms all of Athens' pottery. The Keramikos was a special neighborhood in Athens, where potters created vases and containers that stood all over Greece. This tour will take you through the elaborate process needed to turn something as simple as muddy clay into ornate perfume vases and gilded wine cups. Come find me when you complete your visit, and we can talk more about what you've learned. The Keramicus was a large, sprawling area northwest of Athens Acropolis. While part of it was used as a graveyard, it was also dedicated to the creation of pottery. The Keramikos was so significant to the art form that its name lives on in the word ceramics. Perhaps drawn by the river, potters moved into the area and formed their own bustling community. It's believed that by the end of the 5th century BCE, hundreds of thousands of pottery vessels had been made in Athens. Including everything from heavy, undecorated cooking pots to delicate and beautiful containers reserved for the most precious oils. Sadly, only around 1% of these works survive today, some only in small fragments. Raw clay from a river was hardly fit for a potter's wheel. Athenian potters used clay that was rich in iron, which created the distinctive orange-red coloring seen in Athenian pottery. But this high-quality clay needed to be handled carefully to avoid disasters in the kiln later on. The clay was first brought to settling beds, where it was mixed with water to wash out any organic debris like leaves. Once it was purified, workers kneaded the clay with their hands to push out air bubbles and create the texture necessary for a flawless finish. One of the goals of these early steps was to remove any impurities that could destroy a delicate design, or worse, render a vase unusable. Once the clay was cleaned, it was up to the potter to shape it into a vase by spinning it on a wheel or pressing it into a mold. Their choice depended on what shape they wanted for the vase, but they also considered the possible scope of its decoration. Potters did not work alone. A workshop might have had many people working together on different aspects of production. Potters collaborated with many different painters for decorating their creations. Some of these painters even became potters themselves. All in all, a single vase could be worked on by many different artists, with each one focusing on a different aspect of its design. Oh, 
After the pots were shaped and decorated, they were packed into kilns for the lengthy and delicate firing process. The process had three stages, oxidation, reduction, and reoxidation. The main purpose of the firing process was to carefully manage the clay's exposure to oxygen. The chemical reactions caused by firing gave the pots their distinctive orange-red coloring. This also turned the designs made from the clay decoration slips glossy and black. The most difficult part of the firing process was managing the fires themselves. It required an enormous amount of skill and experience to properly judge the exact temperatures needed, and even the smallest mistake could ruin several hours of work. Vases could be decorated in all sorts of ways. Before 530 BCE, Athenian vases were decorated using the black figure technique where figures and designs were painted as dark silhouettes. At the end of the 6th century BCE, painters created a new technique called red figure, an inversion of the painting process that left the figures in red and the background in black. This gave the artists more freedom to better explore details like muscles and individual locks of hair. Designs were sketched onto the bare surface of the pot using a thin, sharp tool. Thin relief lines, which helped define subtle elements like facial features, were added using a brush made of a few stiff hairs. More elaborate vases were sometimes gilded, but these decorations were so delicate, they were most likely only added after the firing process. You've returned! As you can see, pottery was an arduous and delicate process, but was exemplary of the skill and craftsmanship that dominated Greek art and culture. Now, is there something else you'd like to do? Then we must part ways, at least for now. Farewell, wanderer. friend welcome to kithira where clothes are dyed and noses are assaulted by disgusting smells this little island was where dyers brought all the color to greek fashion through an intensely stinky procedure this tour will reveal the steps it took for workers to brew the dye try not to step in any mollusk guts as you enjoy your visit i promise i'll meet you at the end of your tour See you soon, my friend! In Greece, fabric and clothing were colored using natural dyes from shellfish, insects, and plants. Skilled craftsmen across the Greek world extracted dyes from these sources and combined them with other substances to create a variety of colors. The dyeing process supposedly produced incredibly pungent smells and ancient writers would often comment on the stink in their works. Murex is the generic name for three species of mollusks that reside in the Mediterranean. The substance they secrete was used by craftsmen to create the most expensive dyes in the ancient world, the most famous of which was Tyrian purple. Fishing techniques varied depending on the type of mollusk. In shallow waters, fishermen could simply dive and catch the mollusks, but they set traps if the water was too deep. Being carnivorous, murex were often lured using dead animal flesh as bait. It was imperative that the mollusks be captured alive, as they only secreted the precious purple liquid needed for dyes upon death. The purple liquid that made up most dyes came from a gland in the murex. To collect it, 
workers would either crack open the mollusk's shell with a knife, or if it was smaller, crush it with a stone. Each mollusk only produced a small amount of liquid, and thousands of them were needed to produce even a gram of the substance. Because of this, captured mollusks were usually kept alive in seawater-immersed baskets until enough had accumulated to produce a satisfactory amount of dye. The mollusk glands were mixed with salt and left to decompose for three days. Afterwards, the resulting mash was placed in a vat where it boiled until it was thickened and reduced to one sixteenth of its original volume. The dyers stirred this mixture and removed any impurities. This process produced the foul odor so reviled by ancient writers. Dyers checked the hue of the purple liquid by dipping in raw wool. The hue could be changed by adjusting the temperature of the liquid and by soaking the wool for different periods of time, with longer soaking producing deeper shades. The wool was dyed once before spinning and again before weaving to ensure it maintained its color. While Murex purple dyed wool easily, it did not adhere as well to other fabrics, such as linen. Most Greek garments were made from rectangular fabric that was rarely cut or sewn. They were normally folded around the body with girdles, pins, and buttons. Dyeing served to give the garments a more unique style. Decorations were also widely used and were either woven or painted on. They depicted things like animals, human figures, and mythological scenes. Textile manufacturing and trade was one of the most lucrative businesses in classical Athens. Textiles were made of either wool or linen, with wool being the most common. Women produced the garments worn in domestic life, although some men ran professional workshops that fulfilled the same need. Other textiles were made by slaves and laborers under the supervision of master weavers, fullers and dyers. Clothes didn't just keep people warm. They were used as a way to communicate social identities like gender, status, and ethnicity. These could be expressed through garments and accessories, but also jewelry, hairstyles, perfumes, and cosmetics. Wealthy Greeks usually had garments of the highest quality, and all their accessories were decorated with gold, silver, or gemstones. Parasols and fans were also an important part of elite fashion and were usually carried by accompanying slaves. The most common Greek garments were the peplos, the keton, and the hymation. The peplos, typically worn by women, was a body-length cloth. It was folded back on itself and worn draped over the body and pinned over the shoulders. The keton was a long garment with sleeves. Ankle-length ketones were normally worn by women, while men wore shorter versions of the garment. A hymation was a mantle that was worn over both the keton and the peplos. Outside of daily life, there were also specialized clothes worn only in exceptional situations like weddings and religious ceremonies. Good to see you again, my friend. I bet your clothes feel heavier now that you know how many mollusks were killed to dye them. But let's change the subject, yes? What else can I do for you? You've got it, my friend. Farewell for now.